standing in the rain with his head hung low. You're listening to The Mark Cox Show. Follow the show on Facebook. Facebook.com slash The Mark Cox Show. All you need to understand is that the Republicans declared war today on our national security, on classified information. And- they made a deal with the devil and they feel good about it. You have no idea how years later, months later, some politician might pick apart some piece of information you put right. in there and then use that against you. It, it is really damaging to our country and its institutions. The memo and the basis for the memo, but the uh, underlying documents. And? and what they're putting forth is a total misrepresentation. It is false. There, there are just profound questions that get, have been raised throughout this and are really heightened now about how it could be that the Republican chair of the House Intel Committee continues to behave in ways that seem not just to serve Donald Trump's interests, but seem to serve the interests of a foreign adversary. This is actively co-opting the tactics of Russian disinformation, which is selective, distorted leaks. This is a totally partisan endeavor. Got to play good old Henry there every once in a while when it when there's something when there are comments said consistently this time from the sheet of the Democratic talking points that have been put out about this memo and repeated else you can go to you know most of the places on the dial in the mainstream media and you're going to hear that same garbage spewed over and over and over again these are msnbc came up with that last beauty there these are kgb russia type tactics what they've done here is is uh, appease the russians they did they did this for putin they're releasing this information to somehow help vladimir putin which is which has got to be the most outrageous thing i've heard any of them say because they're desperate to try to bring this back around to Russia. And they have to because, you know, as we've seen over the last few weeks and months, the investigation has shifted away from Russia in collusion and more on trying to trap people into lying to in- investigators. That's what it's turned into now. That's what it is. Right. They're they're only hoping for obstruction. That's their hope at this point, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's kind of what that's kind of what it's come back uh, around to. Um let's let's talk about the the DACA thing for a minute, since I played the the bite earlier from uh, Nancy Pelosi, not backing away from really the the you know the the, the claiming they're trying to make America white again. <laughs> um, wh- what is it with this theme, uh, Chris? You know this Mark Ruffalo. Have you heard of this guy? The, I think he played um, the he played the the scientist that turns into the Hulk on the on the. Uh, action series i remember the one the from actor the 70s. you know who the I, actor is no you don't know who he is i remember the one from the 70s only you don't know who mark ruffalo is no hmm isn't he married to that talk show host and he you know liz doesn't know either okay <laughs> regardless how is it that i know more about this guy than you two that's that unbelievable more. all right so he and uh, michael moore came out and and hosted a counter event to the state of the union and once again described all uh Trump supporters is deplorables and, um, you know, uh, the the ugly underbelly of society. If you're somebody who supports, I don't know, a, a raging economy and <laughs> uh, fair trade deals and more jobs and bonuses, you're, you're the raging underbelly, the ugly underbelly of America. That that's what they uh, that's what they described. Listen to this guy. And I'll tell you, you'll hear it when you hear his bite. You'll understand why I played it. Play cut number 19 for us, please. We have to make a space inside of our privilege for, for, for a safe space for women to speak up. Make a space inside of our privilege so that what? So, so that women have room to speak up. Okay. So it's not, just, it's not just the white privilege. He's talking about male privilege. Does that include me as an African American? Uh, you're, you're male. Okay. So you apparently that Corey, gives you some kind of privilege. But I'm supposed Did you to know have that? my own little thing. Yeah, how do you how does that work? <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying where how do I fit in there? I'm discriminated so, against, so how do I have privilege? So I get a certain amount of privilege because I'm white and no. I get an additional privilege that surrounds that because I'm male. Is that how that works? And because you have privilege. So it's kind of a threesome. That's funny because I don't remember anybody giving me anything growing up. 
Hmm. Now, I understand their argument about privilege, but you, you can be privileged from a variety of different points of view, right? I mean, if you're African-American and your father's a doctor and you're born into a family that has a bunch of money, mm-hmm. you're coming from a position of privilege. I, I certainly didn't come from an economic position of privilege. You know, a lot of the books that I've read over my lifetime, privilege is not always a good thing. Sometimes you need a little hard knocks and a little uh, setbacks and bruises to make you appreciate what you uh, get later in life, success-wise. Well, so it, privilege is not always the, the the golden ticket to a great life and success. You can go through your life making excuses, or you can do something about it. Um I just finished reading a book called Hillbilly Elegy. Hillbilly Elegy. And uh, Hillbilly Elegy. And, and the, mm. uh, the, J.D. Vance was the, the writer of this book. And the reason that I read the book is because it was about my hometown, right? Mm-hmm. This kid, he's a kid, he's 30 years old now, I think, wrote this best selling book about growing up poor uh, with a family from Appalachia that had moved up to this town in southern Ohio to work to get work they worked at his dad worked at a steel mill his grandfather at the same steel mill my dad worked at my dad actually knew his dad so i I read the book because i thought you know we probably have something in common here um but when you read the book this is a guy who came from nothing dirt poor relatives in southeastern kentucky came to ohio still i mean his his family didn't they, they were never they lived in the poor part of town. Let's put right. it that way, right? Not that his grandfather didn't have a decent paying job at the steel mill, but didn't really always filter down to his mother. He ended up spending a lot of time with his grandparents. And I bring all this up to point out the kid now has a, d- a degree from Harvard, and he has a law degree. And it, he had nobody in his family that pushed him to do any of that now he got some guidance from his grandparents as he was growing up that kind of got him on the right track as a student but beyond that he pulled himself up by his bootstraps nobody gave him any of that stuff so and i I point that out as an example because he's a white guy but i certainly don't see where he benefited from any privilege as a result of that he was economically uh, in the poorhouse Yeah, unfortunately to the civil rights community, that still doesn't matter. Even if you come from Appalachia or or maybe uh, have a a similar background as an African-American, single mother or an abusive father, a bunch of kids, some of them will still believe because you have a white skin that an employer or the, the justice system will somehow look upon you more favorably. Because of that, you know, no one starts in, at the same period, at the same point in life. We start at different aspects. But the one aspect that the civil rights community doesn't understand that if you want something, I believe, if you want something bad enough in life, you will find a way to get it. You will get around people that can open up doors for you and you'll be amazed at the miraculous things that you can't even explain will happen to you but you have to well, well to, put you have to do that i think that i think if there's one thing that al sharpton and jesse jackson and a lot of those folks have have <laughs> damage they've done is to consistently give people an excuse yeah. for failure and and you they have to take some responsibility and they just dis- what i just dis- described to you anybody can do that that can happen to anyone but they will describe that as luck hmm. that's luck Chris, good conversation as usual. Thank, Thank you. you, my friend. Uh, be sure and tune in tomorrow night for our post uh, tonight. I should tonight, say yeah. for our post State of the Union address coverage with uh, Tony Colombo and Chris Arps. And I may phone in at some point when the whole thing's over to give you my two cents. How about and that? And I'm going to tell Tony he has to keep the lights up. We're, we're carrying <laughs> we're carrying the uh, the speech live here on FM News Talk 97.1 tonight. So if you're out and about, be sure you tune in here uh, for the very best coverage. Chris, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, hope to see you later this week uh, when we come back. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk more about this Andrew McCabe firing and uh, talk to John Decker as well about the State of the Union. It's all coming up on The Mark Cox Show. This hour of The Mark Cox Show brought to you by Naputi Wellness, naputiwellnesscenter.com. What interest rate would you rather pay on your credit card debt? 17% or less than 6% APR? 
The answer is obvious, Lightstream. Because with Lightstream, you may be able to consolidate credit card debt and dramatically cut your interest rate to as low as 5.49% APR with AutoPay. Plus, radio listeners get an additional rate discount. Just go to lightstream.com slash news. With average interest rates on credit card debt at 17% APR, Lightstream could save you thousands in interest. And because Lightstream 